Uh, good afternoon. Good evening. This is Guillermo Sabatier, your host and of uh, Perspectives on Energy. Uh, I'm Director of International Services at HSI, and joining us today is Brad Schmidt, Chief Commercial Officer at Trident Industries, uh, and they are manufacturers of composite utility poles. So, Brad, welcome to the show. Thank you, Guillermo. Happy to be here. Uh, glad you could be here. <laughs> so uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Brad at the uh, at the EEI TDMMA. You know, that long acronym stands for the Edison Electrical Institute Transmission Distribution Metering Mutual Assistance Conference, where we're both uh, booth neighbors, right? So uh, would you please share with us more about that and your and your backgrounds? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so again, Brad Schmidt, Chief Commercial Officer with Trident Industries. Um, from and live in the Cleveland, Ohio area. My background is in uh, chemistry and polymer science. So I spent the last nearly 11 years with a material science company in various uh, sales roles, mm -hmm. the last six of which I was the sales director for their composites business. Mm -hmm. um, and then this opportunity to join Trident presented itself uh, last fall. I really believe in the product and, and what they're doing. And it seemed like, you know, the right next step for me. So, um, you know, made the, made the decision to join Trident and haven't looked back. And it's been a good short, but good first, uh, you know, six months or so. All right. Well, well, definitely it's, it's uh, this, this product definitely brings a lot of value to the industry. Right. And it is, uh, it is quite a, I mean, quite an accomplishment, really, to actually come up with the, with this new uh, innovative technology, and then have have the uh, the industry begin to accept it, you know, uh, in uh, more and more areas. So, so um, tell me more. So, so, so tell me more about this value, right? Uh, that added value that this brings. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, right now, a lot of utilities that we hear are facing issues with availability mm -hmm. of wood poles that they used to be able to source. Right. Um, either extended lead times or just inability to get polls that, that used to be readily available. Um, so I think it fills that gap first and foremost, but beyond that, then there's a lot of advantages to composites. So um, just if we wanted to start with a little history on Trident. Uh, right. So we were founded in 2007, installed our first polls in 2008. So we've had polls in the field now for 15 years or so. Um, our process, which we'll talk about in a minute, is one where we have a consistent cross-section. So opposed to a tapered pole, ours mm -hmm. are our uniform diameter from base to tip. So we make four diameters up to 110 feet tall and, you know, can meet any of the, uh, the ANSI wood equivalent um, okay. constructions. Um, so as far as availability, because that, again, is, is one of the biggest pinch points right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not speaking for Trident alone. I think most composite pole manufacturers are in the same boat where our, most, actually all of our uh, raw materials are domest domestically sourced. Uh, we carry a fair amount of inventory for emergency response as well as just general lead time. So we operate at a six week lead time, which right now seems pretty attractive compared to some other material options. Oh, yeah. um, as far as our process is concerned, so I mentioned earlier, uh, so we use a, a process called pultrusion, mm -hmm. which makes the continuous cross-section poles. There it is. So, there. yep, <laughs> perfect. Um, so as the name implies, the whole thing is driven by a pulling system. So you're pulling the fibers and, and multi-directional fabric through uh, resin, uh, liquid resin that, that wets out the fiber, Ultimately, it goes through a heated dye that cross-links the resin, and it comes out the other side solid, and then we cut to length at the end of the line. Um, okay. So there's a couple ways to manufacture composites. This is just one. But um, the other thing you mentioned, the value or, or innovation, I suppose. Um, you know, one thing that I, I've heard has come up regarding fiberglass poles is UV stability, and that's okay. always something that, you know, gets questioned. and. Uh, I assure you, we've gone through all the testing. I, I did hear about a, a an incident in Hawaii. This is going back 10 years or so, where mm -hmm. there were some fiberglass lighting poles that had uh, some UV issues and blooming after seven or eight years in the field, uh, which threatened to give the industry you know, somewhat of a bad name. So we've been, not just us, but the entire composites community working really hard to overcome that. And I, I think we've done a great job. We've gone through all the UV testing past, you know, with no issues. Like I said, we've got poles in the field now for 15 plus years and have had no problems there. So um, 
The other thing that we bring that's a little unique or innovative, I'll say, to the to the market is a um, a multi layer design. Mm -hmm. So, um, oh, so here's here's a, just an example of our construction, which which notes the UV resistant veil just below sure. the surface. So that really helps to promote the the resin rich surface, which contains the UV inhibitors and ultimately protects the pole, you know, for its lifetime. Um, yeah. As far it, as the it, multi layer. Construction, yeah, go ahead. Oh, so, 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 tell me more about that multi-directional versus unidirectional, like uh, fabric, right? So, oh, yeah. take it. So, in our process, the majority, I'll say, of the fibers are running in the length of the pole, but right. you still need reinforcement in the ninety degree or plus minus forty five. So, right. we introduce fabric on either side of the roving that gives you that called transverse reinforcement. Okay. The other method of manufacturing composites is a filament winding process mm -hmm. where you're winding around a mandrel. So in that case, most of your fibers are in that circumferential direction as opposed to the, the longitudinal, okay. if you will. Well, so that that definitely adds a lot of uh, a, a lot of like uh, stress resistance, right? Compared to, for example, a spun concrete pole or even a steel pole sure. in that regard, right? Where, where this can actually like, like I imagine it, it's probably a little more resilient than some of these steel poles. Because once a steel pole bends, that's it. So, a hundred percent. I mean that that is really the value. The yeah. value of composites is the ability to flex and then return to their natural. Sure, yeah. form. Mm -hmm. But well, I'm no I'm no stranger to to storm hardening and storm issues in areas of tropical climates. That that you know we we uh, I live in Florida, so and I spent thirty years working for the one of the bigger utilities here in South Florida. And I can tell you that every year was an interesting exercise in replacing wooden poles. And I mean, up to a point, they replaced all of their wooden transmission poles with concrete poles. And then they had the square, the, the square poles that eventually broke quite a bit. And they had success with the with the spun concrete. But but even then, those are when I was there for the last few years, those are getting pretty hard to source at some point. I mean, that that's a long lead time on those concrete poles. Absolutely. We're hearing the same thing with steel and obviously mm -hmm. wood. So, yeah, um, yeah. Con you know, compare if we're going to talk then about concrete or steel, I mean, there are some other inherent advantages to composites. Um, first being weight. Right. right? So much lighter weight, uh, easier to transport, easier and safer to install. Um, and then non-conductive, right? right. So fiberglass doesn't conduct electricity. So whether it's, you know, the lineman safety or even avian protection, uh, not being conductive um, is a big big advantage for composites. Okay. And I imagine the pole bonding can be run inside the pole rather than outside, because then you also run into that risk of copper yeah. theft, which I'm very familiar with as well, with leading with that nonsense. So I can imagine you, you mitigate that yeah. with inside, right? Absolutely. So so when we ship a pole, it's basically ready to install. We will okay. we run the ground wire internally, top cap base plate. We drill all the holes um, if you know per the utilities uh, specification. So yeah, um, we were trying to take as much of the pain points and labor out of the utilities hands as possible, right? Yeah. So so in a, in an environment like Hawaii, I'm sure like Hiko, for example, Hawaiian Electric. I, I mean, what, what's their what's the benefits to them in that particular environment, right? In that particular application. Uh, what what would Hiko look at, for example, as as uh, to select this over any other of the competing competing designs, right? Sure. I, obviously, being an island uh, yeah. or even at a coastal region like the southeastern U.S., mm -hmm. composites have that advantage of um, being inert, so they won't rust, they won't rot right. like wood, right? So in that saltwater air, um, mm -hmm. they're really <clears throat> impervious. Uh, we've we've actually are wrapping up a. About a five-year project in the uh, U.S. Virgin Islands, where we've installed thousands of poles for their storm hardening effort, and wow. one of the reasons they went with composite is just you know for that exact um, reason. Oh, there you go. There's some nice pictures of our poles in service. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, thank you. Um, aside from that, though, again, you know the lightweight, so transportation to Hawaii mm -hmm. being fairly remote uh, can be costly. Um, the fact that these yeah. can be transported more you know more easily because of the weight reduction is is a big deal um and then we we do something unique at trident where we have a multi-layer pole design so we will yeah. nest one of our profiles inside another when mm -hmm. you do that you get a really a, a much yeah. more robust pole right uh so we do a lot of work in self-supporting or unguide applications 
So I know, um, you know, we never want to drill more holes than are necessary. So eliminating right. those guide wires, eliminating that that extra easement or or drilling and labor is a big um, advantage and, and value that I see we could bring to the island. Well, well, tell me more as well, because it really in an island environment, same as the tropical environment where I'm at, these wooden yeah. poles have that the issue would rot. Whenever water just begins to you know settle on top and find its way in, or somehow at the base, you know, you you have to do those those, those annual inspections where, where every few right. years when you're looking and and then down there it begins to rot away. Well, how, how's that uh, compared to those particular assets? I mean, there is no rot, right? Like <laughs> these things are intended to last you know, hundreds of years uh, mm -hmm. in in service or even when they're ap after service life, you know, they're, they're not going to decompose, which brings up a point, right? At the end of life, um, there, we find, we, we've often find um, outlets for them to be repurposed. Right. Um, I was thinking that, yeah. Okay. Yeah, if not, you know, there's a lot of work being done right now in wind blade recycling. Mm -hmm. Our material is is very similar to what a wind turbine blade would be made of. And so um, there are some current technologies to do so. And, and there's a lot of research being done in um, in recycling these sort of materials. Well, I'm sure that, that could be repurposed for like uh, constructing buildings and structures, uh, which is one thing you cannot do with a wood pole. Wood pole has all sorts of, you know, like really interesting chemicals right. in them. Where uh, yeah, they, well, <laughs> no, exactly. That was the other they point leak, I was about to get leach to. Out is, and all that good stuff, so, man. Yeah, no leaching and no maintenance. So that's the other thing is the inspection. Other than visual inspection, once these poles are installed, you really shouldn't have to touch them. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so tell me more about a line worker, right? Having to like uh, put on spurs and go up one of these poles. What, what, what's the approach there regarding? Because I'm sure that's a question most line workers are going to ask. How do I climb this pole? Right. So of course. Yeah. I mean bucket truck, right? No, right. but um <laughs> but we do yeah. have we do have steps, uh working and permanent steps. So again, we would drill the holes or they can be drilled in the field as well. Um, but but we would in, in install um you know steps at whatever height up the pole uh the utility would would request. The biggest thing, so the poles can be installed very much like you would direct bury a wood pole. Right. Um the biggest difference, I guess, the, really the, the primary is the type of hardware. So avoiding the cleated hardware, because mm -hmm. uh, you want to maintain that UV resistant mm -hmm. surface, those, you know what I mean? Um, so other than that, non-cleated hardware, and then the, the yeah, you're not going to climb a pole like you would a wood pole, but if you have the steps installed. The steps then, are, yeah, it's a simple solution. Uh, uh, not much of a learning curve, I imagine, where with the with with with, with the lineman school or line worker school, and so so that that's not really an obstacle or shouldn't prevent anybody from actually thinking of acquiring one in that, that regard. I mean, I'm I'm a I'm a I'm a pretty strong advocate right, of composite poles, given my experience in the past when it comes to like storm hardening, and right. and, and and how resilient the composite poles are compared to the, these other uh assets uh, the, the only thing i think people will probably question would be the um wildfire um susceptibility whereas you know concrete pole but if you got a concrete pole that's 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 got a fire around the chances are the conductors are going to have issues anyway or or so that's fiberglass cross well, it's gonna it's gonna have a problem right so well no not not necessarily so um okay. there are technologies out there and and mm -hmm. there are composite poles that will withstand the wildfire um temperatures and uh, so no, th this has been highly engineered over the years to Wonderful. to be able to withstand those brush fires at 20, 2100 degrees for for a few minutes at least. Oh wow, so, no, that's, that's, that's actually another that's, advantage of of composite. Yeah, definitely a good advantage. And for me, one of the things I've also seen right with saltwater intrusion from the from yeah. the base up is that you you end up seeing some of those like rebar just begin to like corrode and then burst you know slowly crack the actual pole along its length and then crack it and then it collapses at some points i've seen that happen uh so yeah. that's something that you're not going to deal with here either so no exactly there's no water um we've done all that there's actually some moisture some standard moisture tests moisture or water absorption and it's i mean fractions of a percent that that's not a concern oh all. that's wonderful yeah so 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 definitely we have some really really 
significant advantages, right, over over these materials. I mean, also from an environmental standpoint, right, you're not cutting down trees, you're not having to grow entire forests to so then cut them down, and really that that growing those trees takes takes years, sometimes decades. Oh, sure. So, so in this case, you know, using all this land to grow all these trees, when in reality, you, you can use that lumber for something else. So this manufacturing, you, you can probably turn out more or more of these composite poles uh, in the time it takes to grow one of these, like, uh, this lumber, you know, the words, right? Yeah. So. No, we joke. We, we grow trees at a foot a minute, right? So uh, <laughs> much faster than Mother Nature. And, and to your point, yeah. then you're not having to, to cut down trees and, and replant. Um, so no, it's certainly another advantage, and and especially given the the availability issues right now that we right. talked about earlier. Really. Yeah, the the supply chain chain issues. I think some some of them were saying they're almost up to a year to get like a certain inventory of poles restocked. In some cases, yeah. So it's definitely a challenge, right, for some of these, some of these utilities. Um, one of the things we're, we're also so one of the concerns that I was asked, I was at a I was at a um, delivering training at a co op up in Tennessee somewhere. And they asked the whole situation, well, what's it like with a vehicle impact? Or what's it like with uh, ice loading, right? And that sort of thing. Because that's usually their concerns, the ice loading and the vehicle impact. Can you talk we'll about start with the ice loading because that's an easy one. I mean, uh, we, we size our poles based on certain ice loads and wind criteria, right? And so long as we're accounting for that up front, um, I mean, we've yet to, in in all honesty, with our multi-layer design, we've yet to be be given an op, uh, an application and call it sub transmission or distribution that we haven't been able to to meet the the loading requirements. We've even done some steel lattice tower replacement projects with wow. with some of our multi-layer poles. Um, the other thing on the vehicle impact. So while we haven't done actual crash testing. Um, yeah. we've seen plenty of poles be impacted and actually the um, Society of Civil Engineers has a whole FRP pole standard or guideline mm -hmm. um, and they did comment on the vehicle impact specifically so um, essentially it's it's safer I'll just you know start there so for a few reasons number one they're hollow so they can they're able to absorb energy more than a solid wood mm -hmm. pole for example um, and fiberglass or composites just by nature can absorb a fair amount of energy. Um, secondly, if if they are impacted and shear, they they typically do so um, fairly clean, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've even seen instances where, because they're relatively lightweight, the conductor is actually holding the pole uh, still in place rather oh, wow. than it coming down on a car. Uh, and then the last thing I think is the fact again that they're non-conductive. If you mm -hmm. did have a live wire situation. The pole's not going to at least you know be that conductor. Uh, to, to connect yeah, the car. and that's and that's definitely uh, uh, once again an added plus, right? Because uh, there's some regions where you have a lot of some of these poles are though they're they're within a foot of the ending of that of that pavement. Because <laughs> I've seen that right, so oh, yeah. cases, right? not far away from the road. So I mean, it's not always the case. It's not usually the standard. It's, it's usually quite you know at least five six eight feet away from the from the outside edge of that uh of that road but still you know there are times where they, they get off be close so it's definitely good to know and uh so 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 advantages again salt air right those, those difficult environments close to, to the ocean uh, of course has a, a lot of advantages over over wood and definitely over steam right or even like uh rebar reinforced concrete and, and again the severe weather right so the storm hardening this definitely has uh, so many more advantages over those other three types of assets right so 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 here's where we get to the question where we're always going to wonder right it, it's it's how does this compare cost wise and to the all these other assets it took you 15 minutes to get there so that's that's better than most meetings i go to no, uh, <laughs> So obviously that is the, um, you know, our biggest challenge is the upfront cost. So as a general rule of thumb, obviously, depending on, on height and class, mm -hmm. we are call it two to three X, the uh, upfront cost of wood. Now, when you, so you really got to look at composites over the service life. Right. So if you, right. if you anticipate a typical wood pole to last 40 to 50 years, you know, we we anticipate our composite poles to last 80 to 100, and we warranty yeah. everything for, for at least 40. Um, so when you consider having to purchase, well, 
remove an old pole, install a new and purchase a new wood pole in the same time that you would have, you know, one composite pole that alone uh, makes up for the difference typically. But then um, in addition to that, you know, I mentioned earlier, the lighter weight, we mm -hmm. find often you can use lighter duty equipment to install yeah. the poles than you would otherwise the transportation cost, especially, you know, putting it on a boat to Hawaii, you can fit more poles in a container. Um, yeah. So all of these things, when when you consider the the overall life cycle cost of a pole, are actually more attractive than most, you know, the other material option. But you also got to remember, right now, there's even an, an additional group of savings that we didn't talk about. It's the personnel hours. So mm -hmm. now now you're gonna go have to replace that pole as personnel hours, right? That gets involved in that. So now you got to go in there to get a clearance. You're either gonna have to like work it hot, which is usually what they do. So now you're running that risk of having having a flash, you know, hopefully you won't, but then also the risk of creating an outage for the customers. Then so 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 add all these personal hours for that project, right? That's an additional cost that that, that we're not even talking about yet, because you know, when it comes to replacing that. And the and the the pole inspections, of course, are not going to happen as frequently, I imagine, because of the fact that there there there's a lot longer interval here. And then the other thing I can imagine as well is that the type of equipment, like you were saying, that you're using is not as expensive. So so you can probably uh, offset a lot of this cost because now you're not you're not investing on in this this more heavier class of equipment to operate with. You know, whether it's a derrick or these other cranes or something, that's actually like uh, install these poles. Yeah, it's an environment. Yeah. I mean, the, the only other, I, I, not only other, but just thinking about the storm hardening, right? I mean, oh, yeah. on an, in a normal scenario, if you expect your wood to last 40 or 50 years, but here comes a hurricane or whatever, right. and that, now that pole that you installed five years ago, you have right. to replace. So just, and I think the the utility industry is really coming around and thinking about things differently. Mm -hmm. We can't do it the same way we've always done it and go back and replacing these same assets every 10, 20 years even. Um, so everything that you mentioned, but then there's that that hidden cost of well, what happens when the power goes out because right. we lost, you know, a number of distribution. Right, right, right. right. And, that's, and that's the other big cost, whether it's safety or may fee or safety minutes that they were talking about, which is the amount of time, for example, that a customer's out. That ultimately is translated into, into uh, there's dollars behind that, right? Where oh, yeah, it's, not, it, it's not really powering, not selling, but rather there's there's a whole other index, right? A customer satisfaction that is involved in that. And then, of course, there's some environments, too, where I imagine these poles are probably easier to transport with, with, with aircraft, whether it's a rotor. You can airlift them a little bit easier, right? Than, uh, sure. than a concrete pole or a steel pole. No, I mean, we've had instances where rather than having to build a service road out to a remote, remote location, mm -hmm. you know, rent a helicopter for a day or whatever and just oh. just drop the poles in um so yeah. especially in mountainous regions and yeah. so I, I i have been to hawaii it's fortunate yeah, enough so to win the a, application yeah. yeah yeah so i was there it's probably been 10 years now but um beautiful obviously yeah. beautiful place to to visit and to live um so make the infrastructure as beautiful right i mean these poles are yeah. i'm biased but i think they're they're pretty good looking and we've actually have customers who will only put composite poles in like their you know main street because of the aesthetics so yeah, um, yeah. but you yeah formally yeah. aesthetics and well, well there there's believe it or not there's cases where i i heard of a few lawsuits where a customer got splinters on their hand because they because they they grabbed or held on to one of the wooden poles on the sidewalk which I guess had been had plenty of like splinters sticking out because of all the spurs going up and down, and right. he got a they I'm not sure who you know which end of the word, but they 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 got splinters in their hand. They were able to get a pretty good lawsuit out of it because of some some infection and injury that they had. But so just that that, that that's another possibility that that comes to mind. I'm reminded of, of that incident right where this and one of the reasons they changed those poles out and they put a concrete poles on there was that was one of the contributing factors you know to to justify the concrete pole besides storm hardening it was the 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 litigious nature of that customer base in that area so well and, and that's a challenge though that we face too i, I go back to the uv comments earlier mm -hmm. right um wouldn't be splinters but you know people have this conception that um when fiberglass ages it will bloom the glass blooms to the mm -hmm. surface and that's mm -hmm. what we are working and have prevented with our uv 
you know, the surface veil I mentioned, and then the the inhibitors in the resin systems. Um, but there's still this this notion that that, that in, will right? be the case. Yeah. So that that's our challenge to overcome. But again, we've done all the testing and and um, have had no issues regarding you know dry fiber um, as it's referred to. Right, right. So, 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 so the cost, you know, is, is, is maybe a little more than, I mean, a bit more than wood, a little more than steel, right? Uh, it's, yeah. it's, and then is it less than concrete or, or, or? The concrete, it really, from my experience, limited, I've been here six months, but uh, it, it, it kind of depends more on where you're located. If you're close right. to a concrete foundry and the transportation cost is minimal, then um, we're certainly more expensive. But if you have to transport concrete a long distance, you know, that it's heavy, right? So, right. Um, so, so it varies. But uh, but even steel, yeah, the upfront cost is going to be a little more, but the lack of maintenance, you know, and then an inspection over the years, again, um, we, we find we typically come out ahead well that's definitely some great applications and 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 so 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 let's circle back to the idea of of uh going back to like how this could be an advantage for like hawaii for example right now mm -hmm. or a company like hiko what, what would like really motivate them to want to look at this let's look in, mm -hmm. in this in this environment yeah i mean i, I certainly storm hardening Mm -hmm. um, and, and with ours, at least in particular, the, the unguide or self-supporting applications to eliminate the need for easements and drilling extra holes. And um, we do a lot of work in, in eliminating guying issues or concerns. Right, right. Uh, and then obviously composites, the fact that they're not going to rust, they're not going to rot, they're safer for wildlife, no, uh, no woodpecker issues, no insect right. um, issues. So um, all of that. And then lastly, I think, you know, comparing to steel or, or reinforced concrete with, with steel rebar, they're not going to rust. So right. just the, the long-term aesthetics too, that I mentioned and, you know, complementing mm -hmm. the, the beauty of Hawaii, I think. Uh, well, certainly. well, one of the things, well, I mean, even in Florida, we, we've had issues with bobcats climbing these poles and they're just sitting on top of the pole and then they got to come out and yeah. get a bucket truck and get them down. And the line workers terrified because what's that cat going to do once you bring it in the bucket? <laughs> so yeah, no, that, that's something where also it's it, the animals unable to claw its way up there eating as well. So it's right. city yeah. little details that, that they're really, but you get them all together and, and, and they point in a certain direction, right? So, so uh, as far as HSI, right, we can do, I, I, I imagine we, we could help, for example, with just helping with the initial training or or even getting yeah. this, these line workers qualified electrical workers we have a program that that really uh, has a, a lot of embedded training regarding line workers qualifying electrical workers or even anything distribution so so i'm sure this is something that could be easily incorporated into like a training program like ours and just minimize that learning curve right so for these like line workers. yeah We'd love to partner with HSI and in, in, in developing some sort of whether it's Ooh. online training or yeah. even in, in person. We do a lot of in-person training um, prior to a pilot installation with a new utility. Uh, oh, we find that you know there's a little apprehension at first, but really the similarities to installing a you know traditional wood pole are really you know people get over that yeah. that learning curve pretty quickly. Okay. All right. So I think we're at the end of our show. Wow. We really used up those 30 minutes pretty fast. fast. Yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> so is there anything else you think you want to add or we just can go ahead and wrap it up in this case? Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate you having me on. I think it was a great discussion. Hopefully some folks took, took something away from it and um, great. composites continue to gain uh, market acceptance. They sure do. They sure do. And once again, Brad, thank you so much for appearing on the show. Uh, um, uh, it's, it's really great to, to have you here and 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 have you uh, introduce you to our to our things like Hawaii community and, and viewers and and hopefully you know expose you to the rest of the industry in this part of the world, uh, mainly Hiko and then all the other like tropical island t type of uh, utilities and munis and co-ops that you know will definitely benefit from from from, from your products and services. So, all right. Well, thank you very much for appearing. I look forward to seeing you again on the show pretty soon. And uh, and all right. uh, and uh, so uh, for all the viewers, I mean, uh, Brad's contact info is, uh, has been pasted on the uh, all throughout the show. And also you'll see it in the, uh, in the show description as well. So thank you all for joining. Uh, thank you for that. And have a wonderful afternoon and evening, everybody. Thank you, Brad. Okay, thank you. Take care.
Thank you so much for watching ThinkTech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.